What's up, y'all, and welcome back to Found Bites, a game review series. My name is Brian, and I'll be your host. If you don't know about us, we're all about testing out and finding small, high-quality video games. This is a podcast that aims to respect your time and money as a gamer and a consumer by sifting through storefronts and sales to find those gems that may be worth your precious resources. If you're interested in reaching out or helping out, check out the links in the description of each episode to access our email, Twitter, website, and YouTube channel. But enough about the show, let's get into our next game. Leica Aged Through Blood is the game for this week's episode. Leica is an action platformer, twin stick metroidvania, all kinds of words there, but we'll talk about what they mean and break it down. It's definitely a very unique game, and a lot of comparisons to metroidvanias like it that are unique in their traversal, like Dandera and Gunbrella, which we did recently. The game was originally released in October of 2023 on PC, then in December of 2023, it came to PS4 and 5, Xbox One, Series X, and S. And it was announced for Switch, and it was supposed to release, but it was delayed indefinitely as of right now. So it may still be coming, but it's not clear when that's going to happen. The game was developed by Brainwash Gang, and they're a small team from Spain. And they've released other games like Non-Guns and Friends vs. Friends. I've not heard of either of these games, but I think they're semi-popular. And the game was published by Head Up Games, and they're a publisher out of Germany. And most notably, they've published games like the Bridge Constructor series. I think that's Bridge Constructor Portal and whatnot. Definitely heard of those. The game was released with an MSRP of $19.99. And runtime, if you're running straight through just the main story, not doing any side quests, maybe 16, 17 hours, maybe a little more. But there's a lot of extras to do in this game alongside just straight up exploration you could put in over 25 hours easy. And it does have a platinum trophy for our PlayStation listeners. Uh, it's sitting at about 4%. So it's not terrible, definitely achievable. I don't know if I will get it. I actually have not looked at the trophy list. Me, I've been playing this on PS5 and I got it on sale for $14.99. So far I've put in about 15 hours. I'm doing a lot of extras. I think there's maybe seven or eight of the main quests and I've definitely gotten through halfway, but I've been doing a lot of side quests. I actually just had a bunch of side quests kind of resolve themselves, so I'm taking my time. And in terms of recommendation, I've never heard of this game, never seen it. I saw it in a PSN sale, and really the visuals uh, reminded me a lot of, like, some of the Paper Mario games or, like, Darkest Dungeon, where it's, you know, kind of got these characters walking through or moving around, and they look like paper figures, and sometimes they have outlines on uh, their coloration. And really the main draw was that traversing through this game, you do it on a motorcycle, and the gameplay for that is very interesting, which we'll talk about next. Let's talk gameplay for Leica. So this is a Metroidvania-esque, so you'll definitely see some of the typical tropes that you would see. 
You'll have a map where you can put markers on there. There'll be fast travel. Definitely be some backtracking, going back to old places once you get a new thing or a new ability. But really what makes this game interesting and unique is the basics. And they are not so basic because it has to do with how you move and traverse in this game. It's a 2D game. You're on a motorcycle. There's a button for gas and there's a button for brake. And you can hold a button to switch which side you're facing. So you can constantly drive one way, do kind of this turn that's almost like a handbrake type thing, and you're going to switch to the other side. So that's going to have some interesting consequences for how you platform in this game. And really the driving force behind the variety and the uniqueness of the platforming has to do with the terrain that you see. So most of the terrain as you're going across is going to be flat and then maybe some bumps, but then a lot of it is going to be ramps. And it could just be like a rock kind of jutting out in a triangle form. And as soon as you go up it, you go into the air. Or sometimes it could be more intentional where it's like a exponential kind of curve where you're going up in a ramp. The consequence of that is that you're constantly going to be airborne in this game, and that introduces one of the main mechanics, which is when you are airborne, you can rotate the motorcycle, and you can rotate it clockwise or counterclockwise, forwards or backwards, depending on which way you're facing, and this rotation allows for a lot of different things. One of the main things is in air, you're going to be adjusting to whatever incline or curve that your motorcycle is about to land on. So you might go up a ramp, and the only place to land is like another curve that goes down. So you have to kind of readjust your incline to match the wheels to the surface. One of the other major things is that rotating in the air is going to involve another mechanic, which is a reload mechanic. And this is for reloading your weapons. When we start to talk about combat, this is going to allow for a lot of synergy between just straight up traveling and traversing and getting into combat and shooting and reloading and blocking bullets and things like that. And we'll get into that in a little bit. But the variety of the platforming is also really good. You're going to do a lot of big jumps where you're very high up in the air. Uh, you're going to drive through loop-de-loops where instead of being in the air, you'll actually just go right on the surface in the loop and then come out the other side. And so the platform, while you're in the air, the platforming is going to be constant readjustment constant centering mid-air. You could even be turning around mid-air because a lot of times you're going to go up a ramp and then the surface that you're going to land on this curve is going to require that you're actually facing the other way when you're coming down the curve. Another thing is that your momentum matters. So if you have kind of a steep curve that you need to go up, you definitely need to drive for a little bit and pick up some momentum. If you're kind of stationary and then trying to drive up an incline, it's really not going to work. So the physics of the momentum is really important. And also just the general gas break brake physics is really interesting because as you're driving along like you can kind of pop up the front wheel and do a little wheelie and sometimes when you're landing if you land like too far angled back you might just be on the back wheel or you might be very close to like the person on the motorcycle kind of sliding against the surface but you can even while you're standing there stationary prop up the front wheel or the back wheel and just kind of hit the gas a little bit and then consequently sometimes you might actually along the terrain have to like climb in place at times. So you might come across like a dead end and it's like a very small lift onto another platform and you can prop up your front wheel and then kind of move forward and hit the gas. It is interesting how the physics work with the gas and the brake. One of the main things you're gonna be doing in this game is avoiding death. And there are a couple different ways to die, but the main thing that you need to be aware of while you're platforming is that you cannot land upside down. You cannot land with the character who's on the motorcycle into the ground. That can be for any reason. It could be because you go up a ramp and you come down and you're flat with the person's head on the ground. It could be that you're sliding down a ramp and you can't quite get the front wheel down and your character eventually just kind of falls. It could be that you're actually sitting there propping up the wheel and your motorcycle could fall backwards and you would die. So all of these things need to be kept in mind. So it's basically that your character and their head or the top of their body needs to be away from danger at all times. The other major aspect of this game is the weapons and the shooting that you're going to be doing. Like in the intro, we talked about this being a twin stick game. So your aiming of the gun 
is on the right stick if you're playing on console. It is independent of you rotating your bike in midair. So what you can do is you can be rotating your bike and point the gun downwards and it's going to be pointing downwards the whole time. This is very helpful. I feel like if this were to be tank controls with the twin stick, people would go insane. But I really like this. It makes combat really easy because you can just point where you want to point and then you can do the rotation with the other stick and kind of figure out where you're trying to land. The way that shooting works is that you hold the button to shoot and it essentially turns into this bullet time. It won't shoot again until you release it, and so while you're holding it, you can adjust your aiming. And what's really nice is there's a meter that kind of points where you're aiming your gun, and this meter is showing you how many bullets are in the clip of your gun, and as the bullet is kind of slowly ticking around the meter in each section, that's telling you how much time you have on the bullet time. So there is a limited time for each shot that you're taking, and if you hold it past that time limit, it'll automatically shoot it. So of course you're going to come across things to shoot in this game, and one of the major ones is going to be enemies. But a lot of other things that you're going to see are these chests or boxes that you can open up to get materials. There are going to be resources kind of hidden in the foreground of the environment that you can shoot to kind of give you the resources, and you have to go and kind of forge them after they fall from wherever they are. And then you're going to possibly shoot switches or things to open doors. When you are seeing enemies and interacting with them. This is when combat is very interesting. So like I said, when you're in the air and you're rotating a certain way, it's going to reload the clip of your gun. So you do have that marker where you're aiming that tells you how many bullets are left in the clip. And as soon as that's out, you're definitely gonna wanna reload. So how it works is reloading your gun will be one full rotation backwards. So if I'm driving to the right and I go up a ramp, this would be going counterclockwise. There's an interesting back and forth here because if you have a couple shots you can get them off and again as you're shooting and aiming there's kind of a slowing down of time because of bullet time so you can maybe kind of get two shots off or something like that and then quickly rotate and reload and then shoot again if you need to. Something that's also interesting when you're around enemies is you can block enemy shots. There are a couple different ways to do this. Uh, one of the main ways is once you're in the air if enemies shoot at you as long as it hits the bike you don't get hit. The main way that that happens happens is that you face the bottom of your bike down so that where they're shooting from uh, it's just hitting the bottom of the bike and the bike doesn't take any damage but as soon as you kind of expose your head given the trajectory of the enemy shots you do expose yourself to being hit and one hit will kill you also while you are flat on the ground you can block or deflect shots and basically what that is is the same button you use to hold and turn and drive in opposite directions if you just tap it and time it when a bullet is coming it'll deflect the bullet back but that is also a mechanic that needs to be reloaded and so when you're up in the air if you've blocked or deflected a shot while you were on the ground you need to reload that mechanic and so you need to go forward through an entire rotation so again if you're driving to the right that would be a clockwise rotation so it's really interesting kind of the combination of reloading your weapon versus reloading your deflection I found that I often forgot that I could deflect bullets while on the ground I think you can even do it while in the air but I was just involved with just trying to shoot and then face the bottom of my bike towards the ground so it would hit the bullets and I wouldn't get hit. So the name of the game to avoid dying is avoid getting shot and avoid landing on your head in any way. Something else that you'll come across as you're going through combat and enemies are shooting at you, similar to a recent game that we did, Steam World Heist, there is some variation of the platforms that you'll be on or that you'll pass by and the surfaces that they are composed of where sometimes a bullet can go through it, sometimes it can't. You'll eventually get used to that as you see more environments but really kind of the main tell that I use when I'm going through areas for the first time is whether enemies see me and try to shoot me through a particular platform and if I see the bullet kind of go I'll recognize like okay I can shoot through that and again dying is what you're trying to avoid so there are basically three ways of dying we already talked about turning over or having your head hit the ground getting shot your character getting shot by any enemy projectile and the other one is falling into a pit which is a little more forgiving because what's going to happen is anytime you die some of your currency is going to be left at that location in the sacks so this is straight out of games like Shovel Knight, Dandera, where part of the dying mechanic is that you go back to a recent checkpoint or a save point, and then you need to go back to that location you died at to retrieve your lost currency. There is a certain number of sacks of the currency that can be left behind before they start to overwrite and you lose them forever. This is something that you'll eventually upgrade, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. 
Now let's get into locations and progression. So this is a Metroidvania, there will be a map. And the way the map works is it's kind of this 2D cross section of what we're seeing. So we're seeing everything from the side. You've got like these vague areas that have labels and each of these areas will have a way to connect. And what's gonna happen is when you get in an area, you'll kind of arrive on a screen and then it's one single continuous area. And so the screen might move, you might go up, you might go to the side or even down. Down, but as long as you're in that area, you, the screen is going to move where your motorcycle moves. And then when you reach the edge of an area, you'll go through kind of like an overpass or something like that. And then you'll go off the screen and then there'll be a little bit of a load screen and then you'll go into a new area. So these areas are kind of sectioned off or broken up, but they are pretty continuous once you're in them. Uh, and they do vary in size, but they're all fairly big in terms of just general platform areas. When you're looking at the map and you have a map of the area you're in, it's very detailed, it's very helpful, and you can zoom in and actually look at the terrain, even to the point where you can see where the ramps are and where you can connect to the next ramp to kind of plan how to get from A to B. So this is really good. In Metroidvanias, backtracking can really be a pain, so it's nice to not only get details from quests, but actually be able to look at the map for a detailed blueprint of how you're going to get from one place to another. And when you enter a new location, often pretty close to where you enter it, there will be a map seller. Sometimes it takes a little bit of platforming puzzling to get to where they are, but you can probably make out where they are pretty quickly. And this is really good because sometimes you'll go to a new area and you'll want to explore, but the map won't be there. So it'll just have your icon kind of roaming in this emptiness until you actually purchase that map. And exploration is really what drove me a lot during this game. Once you get into a new area, as soon as you get into the map, you want to maybe explore and find what you can see. You're definitely going to encounter a lot of enemies, like I said, and the variation in terms of how frequently you come across them, how big the encounters are, like how many enemies, it does vary, and I like that. What also can vary with different enemy types is is how far away they can see you, so their aggro distance. But what is really nice is when you start that bullet time and you're aiming your gun to try and shoot, the view does kind of extend out a little bit, so you can stretch it and see a little further, which is nice. And even if you don't see an enemy off screen, if you shoot a bullet and you know where an enemy was and the projection kind of lines up, you can hit and kill enemies off screen. There are a lot of save and respawn points these are the same point. The frequency of them is very high. And sometimes it's because in a very small area, there might be switches to kind of change a bridge or move something to go on a different direction or on a different track. And so sometimes in a very small area, you might have two or three save points just to kind of save to be in that location if you happen to be like trying a big jump and you miss it or something like that. I can't say the same about the fast travel locations. There are really not a lot of these. Like I would say for every two named areas there's maybe one and that can be frustrating at times I feel but overall I feel like given how I feel about the traversal and the movement in general I didn't mind it but if you're somebody that gets frustrated about you know having to traverse through the same places or something like that it might get a little annoying for you and fast travel points are not just for fast travel uh, once you get there you can change your weapon loadout and we'll talk about weapons in a minute but you can also do something else which is cook based on supplies that you've come across and kind of give yourself some uh, immediate buffs. Also, while you're exploring, you're going to find a lot of NPCs. When you talk to them, they'll give you some exposition, and they might give you side quests to kind of run on. Also, in some areas, you'll have places where you can set the bike down and get off and kind of walk around. These are interesting locations. The main one where this is going to happen is the hub, but you might come across like a gas station or, or a shop or something like that that you go into. So these do happen pretty frequently, and it's really interesting how it changes because you don't walk as fast as you can ride the motorcycle. But it's not so frequent that it's like a drastic change in pace and you get annoyed by it. I think it's just a nice respite. You also have boss encounters. These these are so cool. The way they work out are like their chase sequences. So you're kind of driving in like this endless loop. They are so fun and epic. Some of the bosses are basically going to be three hits and done. Very Zelda. But what I like about this is because they're like these chase sequences, you're really driving and doing your aerials and rotations and reloading. And it really highlights what is amazing about this game, which is just when you're driving and shooting and reloading. And I love that in these boss arenas, it lets you do it on this continuous loop. 
And of course, the game is going to progress through quests. And so you'll have main quests and side quests, and they're kind of marked in your journal. Most of your main quests are going to be these multi-step ones, where it's like you have to go to this place, and then you have to go there. And then once you get there, you have to go back to the original place. And most of these are going to be given to you at the beginning of the game or when you return to the hub after you've completed one you'll get the next one and they're going to be a couple times in the game where you're going to have multiple main quests to do at the same time and you have to do all of them kind of like what happens sometimes in games like control some of these main quests you're going to be traveling far so it's really trying to get you to explore really encouraging that really stretching out what you're seeing and what you're coming across and also a lot of these are going to require like that metroid like key it might be getting a specific upgrade or a specific weapon, but it's something that you will need to do the next main quest. And then the side quests that you come across, of course, these are optional. They'll be dependent on you finding NPCs out in the world, but also you might get them from some of the NPCs in the main hub. Some of these are fetchy. I would say the majority of these are, but I don't find these very cumbersome at all. When you look in the journal, it's going to give a fair description of where you have to go. Sometimes it might be vague, like somewhere in the northeast of this area. But when it describes like the type of terrain that it's going to be found in, it might even be easy to see on the map. And so a lot of what you're going to be doing is fetching, kind of seek and find quests. But again, that is going to encourage exploration for you, much like the main quests. There is a weird synergy with some of the side quests. I think some of them are actually required to progress the main quests. One of the side quests was to find a particular item that would allow you to tear things down or big statues and I think that if I didn't do that I wouldn't be able to progress one of the main quests I'm not sure completely if it was dependent but an interesting synergy there and the consequence of doing these side quests a lot of it is going to be helping NPCs to recruit them to come back to your hub and for some of them once you get them in your hub it's going to allow you for more upgrades so I do like the synergy there speaking of the hub when you're at your hub like I said it's the major source of quests main and side and this is where you're going to be able to upgrade your character, upgrade your weapons, and talk to a lot of the main NPCs in the game. What's also interesting is that the hub goes through this day-night cycle where when you wake up in the morning, there are certain NPCs who are kind of out and you can talk to them. Certain huts or buildings or whatever are open, rooms that you can access and talk to people in there and get the NPC quests that might be in there. But then when you come back after going out, it'll be nighttime and then different people will be out out or different rooms will be open to go to. So I'm not exactly sure what triggers it. I don't know if it's like spending a certain amount of real time out in the world exploring or if it's going between different areas or, or something like that. I'm not sure the triggering but this is something to pay attention to because the progress for some of your quests or being able to access progress might depend on whether it's day or night at the main hub. And you're going to be upgrading your character. What you can do is you can craft different weapons. You can upgrade the weapons that you already have, whether it be upgrading their clip size or how much of an angle you have to rotate to reload which is really interesting because sometimes you don't need a full rotation you might only need like an angle of 120 and then you can upgrade your character's capacity and one of the main ones is the number of weapons they can hold so while you're in game you can rotate between weapons if you have enough weapon slots to put something in there and then you can also upgrade the number of sacks that get left behind of your currency if you die. So if you upgrade this to like four or five, that means that you can die five times and still retrieve all of that currency. But once you die a sixth time, that first sack that you lost of your currency is going to disappear forever. And a lot of these upgrades are going to depend on you getting materials from your environment. So as you're exploring the environment, you're also trying to farm and forage for a lot of these materials. And this is going to require that you're shooting certain things that you see in the scenery. And so as you're progressing, progressing through if you're in an enemy encounter and you see something that uh, might give you resources you have to kind of weigh the pros and cons of like if you have a bullet you want to kill the enemy first and then reload when you're in the air so a lot of this sort of synergy going on all at the same time and then just some other miscellaneous things that you're going to come across i mentioned cooking where you're combining foraged items i haven't really used this i'm not really a big fan of this because as soon as you cook it i think you eat it immediately and it gives like a buff to your character but it immediately starts a timer so it's more real time. I kind of wanted to craft things and have an 
and inventory of things to consume later. You'll also be collecting cassettes, and these cassettes are the soundtrack that are playing kind of in rotation. So you hearing the whole soundtrack is really dependent on you finding these cassettes out in the world, which I think is an interesting mechanic. And then you'll also have a mini game at certain places you'll be able to play blackjack and wager some of your currency and win more. And finally, in terms of accessibility, I feel like this might be hit or miss for some people. There's no difficulty options in this game. You will definitely die a lot, whether from enemies or from basic traversal, getting the hang of it. Even as you're just sitting there trying to move, you might pop a wheelie and just flip your car and die. So it's definitely going to happen. It will take time to learn the movement. I feel like it puts you in this state where you're never kind of passively traversing through this game. You always have to be mindful of like, okay, I can't topple over. So that might kind of rub people the wrong way. But I do feel like the currency loss dying, I don't feel like it's that consequential because you can retrieve it pretty fairly. And also if you upgrade the number of sacks that you can leave behind, you can kind of make a lot more mistakes uh, before having to lose that currency forever. Alright, let's talk vibe for Leica. And let's start with some visuals. So this game is very colorful. You'll definitely see some deep greens, some deep reds, some light blues, some tans, most of which you'll see in the characters and their garb and sort of what they're wearing. And then the characters will also have black outline that's separating, whether it's their clothes from their body. You'll definitely see the black outlining to really make those characters kind of punch forward and recognize the detail in what they're wearing and, you know, what accessories they might be holding. I definitely see a lot of similarities to character designs in like the Paper Mario games or the Bug Fables games or Dark. Darkest Dungeon. Darkest Dungeon is maybe a little darker, but that aesthetic of like comic book little cutout things walking in front of the environment and that contrast with the environment and the depth that you see. And speaking of the environment, you're definitely going to see for the majority a lot of like savanna or canyon like backgrounds. So a lot of sand and dust, dust bowl aesthetic. So most of the tans and maybe the reds or the ambers are what you're going to see in the environment. And as you're coming across things in the environment that you can forage, whether it's things in the ground or things on the ceiling that outlining that goes on with the character models is the same that you're going to see here and so it is very clear when something is forageable and you can shoot it and kind of collect things and you'll also come across some interesting visuals with the ramps and kind of choosing whether to access certain ramps because what you're going to see is like you might have a flat platform and then in the middle of it you might have a ramp that's going up and before you get to the ramp you can choose whether you want to just drive straight through or whether you want to go up the ramp and if you want to go up the ramp you have to to kind of like pop a wheelie a little bit or at least like a slight tendency of cocking the front of your motorcycle backwards and so what's interesting is visually this might lead to some confusion because sometimes there are crossing ramps whether it's in a loop-de-loop or whether it's having to come from a, a different location altogether so if you have like crossing ramps the first time I encountered this I thought that I could jump from one ramp to the other by trying to wheelie it but in fact what's going to happen is when you see things like this it's going to require like separate actions access to go the other route like up the other side of the crossing ramp so that'll just take some time to get used to but it was a little kind of jarring the first time I recognized that definitely a lot of detail when you're inside things like you'll be inside rooms or you'll be inside caverns and you'll see kind of the detail in the background that's like right there in front of you but then contrast that with when you're outside and sort of the vastness of the background and the depth of it I really like how in both cases you see that detail or you see that range of depth and zoom and scale is also another thing sometimes when you're in a new area and it's just flat ground for a little while the camera will zoom out to give you a sense of like the background or the grandeur of maybe a set piece that's coming up or the ramp or the trajectory that you might have to do so this does this automatically and the other main visual is that there's a lot of blood and violence in this game so you're going to be shooting guns and 
enemies are going to get shot and they're going to gush out guts and you'll see the gunshot wounds and all kinds of things like that. And then as soon as you kill an enemy, their carcass will just sit there uh, until the next time that you, you know, reload the area or die and respawn. In terms of audio, the music is nice. It's mainly vocals that are kind of over this light tempo guitar. Sometimes it's got a bit of a country twang to it. Sometimes it's a bit longing and lonesome. It reminds me a lot of Transistor because there was a lot of that vocalist in there and kind of this moody, melancholy undertone. And so I do enjoy it. I would prefer that there were less vocals and that there were more ambience, like ambient music, because I like the variation of tempos or when you're in a certain area and the feel is different. But I do feel like the way it is kind of fits the setting, kind of this open dystopian, we're not really sure what's next. And so we have this melancholy feeling going on. And so speaking of the setting and the themes, this is like this post-apocalyptic dystopia and it's very Mad Max. Like you're in this sandy, rocky dust bowl and you're living in your hub where there are these makeshift abodes that are made out of materials kind of sewn together randomly and you're going and trying to find resources. You're basically like a scrapper trying to scrap together materials and you have this motorcycle and your character is also riding through and they have a helmet on that's made of bones of some animal and it's really badass the way it looks and then you've got these guns so it just reminds me so much of the aesthetic of Mad Max because it's like something is wrong in this world but we're still able to drive a vehicle and kind of customize and people are just picking up things and using them as things to wear or things to make their house out of and the outfits that some of these characters are basically just patched materials and some of them are wearing these hoods or cloaks but then the accessories the detail and the accessories that you see like your main character has a single earring dangling from their ear and it just looks so badass and uh, alongside the bone helmet. Another thing is that all the characters are animals. So all of the enemies are birds. So birds are the enemy. That's like an army that you need to watch out for and, and try not to get hit by. And you'll see different types of birds or different colored birds, but they're all kind of dressed in these army uniforms. And then all the people on your side are I think just like all the mammals or all the land animals that are kind of subject to the rule of the bird army or whatever and so they're all your kin a lot of them are kind of in the canine family but there's definitely some others that aren't and so this shows up with you know a lot of subtle humor in the dialogue whether it's about them being animals or or birds being the enemy and i do like that i just like how the world also has this weird synergy with like this mad max dystopia and the fact that they're animals and how they think and how they're trying to like come together or fight a common enemy and i also like how the map is labeled this is such a subtle detail that i find just so interesting the hub is just called where we live and then there are other places like where rocks bleed and that's where the mines are and there's another place called where iron caresses the sky and so it's just the way that these places are named is so interesting because it's like that's how these animals would think like your main character is a wolf and it's like they're not going to be like oh let's name Name this town, you know, Flendersonville or some crazy stuff like that. It's going to be like, no, let's go to that place, that place where we used to live or where all was lost or where this or where that. It's almost like a, you know, Friends episode titles. But it's so interesting just with how these pack animals might think to call certain places or how they might communicate them. And it's also interesting because your sort of clan or society is this matriarchal society and there's these themes of like having to pass on the burden of the eldest female to their next child and there's also this interesting thing about how your character has this power where they can talk to the dead and kind of get understanding of what they're going through or something like that. So a lot of weird stuff there that's really interesting and it also plays very strongly on relationships specifically between mother and child, that bond there, and sort of how this passing on the burden of this power goes in this society, um, and sort of the guilt, you know, not wanting to raise their child or wanting to save their child from something like that that might be damaging to them.
All right, let's wrap up the conversation about Leica Age Through Blood. This is a really enjoyable experience for me. I think the basic gameplay is so unique, the traversal, it reminds me so much of Dandera and how just kind of taking typical Metroidvania and turning it on its side and the basic traversal having to not take it for granted. I really love the synergy of going in the air, aiming your shot, depending on how many shots you have left, and having to rotate midair in that bullet time, and trying to figure out how you land, and maybe having to turn around, and then dealing with other enemies. I just find it so thrilling to go through this, and have all these things happening at the same time, because it's not something that you typically deal with in a Metroidvania, so it's very unique, and I really feel like this is best highlighted with some of the boss battles in this game, where you're just free to drive in a loop and do whatever mechanics you need to do to reload or to block enemy shots or to shoot the enemy. And so having all that in sort of a free mode, which is basically what a boss battle is, is really, I think, where the game shines its best. I love the idea of this game, the concept of it, the characters, the setting, everything feels so alive and real and grounded. We talked about there being blood and violence. There's cursing in this game. There's all kinds of abuse, whether physical or emotional. This game deals with a lot of heavy things. And I love that it's in this Mad Max environment. You've got animals in this sort of state of war. It's such an interesting mashup. I feel like this game deserves so much attention. It might become cumbersome sometimes with the dying and having to respawn and all the enemies respawn, especially if you die by just, you know, not landing correctly. I'm sure that can get frustrating for people. And also, I feel like the map is really not that big. There aren't that many areas and the areas are really not that big. They do have like a verticality to them, but I can understand why someone might get frustrated by those things. In terms of value, $20 I think is good. This is a good price for this game. If it's ever on sale, I think it's a steal. I got it for 15. I think 15 is a steal for this game. It's a really good price. And so if you feel like this might be up your alley, if you like Metroidvanias, but you're looking for a different take on it, the basic movement and the comfort might be hit or miss. But if it hits, I feel like if you really like this gameplay, you're going to love this game and the value and the reward that you get by playing it is going to skyrocket. So I highly, highly recommend this game. All right, that's going to wrap it up for this episode. Stay tuned for our next episode to see what new game we found for you.